everyone and welcome. We're so delighted to have you. My name is Jacqueline Daly and um, Lance Wilson and I who are the co-chairs of Black Anglicans are just delighted mm -hmm. that you've taken time on this really nice evening to be with us as we continue to mark Black History Month. Um, we're thrilled to welcome um, Natasha Henry, uh, who is a president of um, the Ontario Black History Society. And you'll hear more about Natasha um, as um, Reverend Vernal Savage int will introduce her later on in the program. Um, we are just here to kind of amplify um, um, Black folks in the life of the church. And thank God we started these um, webinar um, as a result of the unfortunate murder of um, George Floyd um, last year and we will continue to kind of hold space to um, talk about issues that are relevant to the Black experience in, in, in our context. So welcome again. We are really delighted that you've taken time to be with us. We're going to be here for about an hour um, and, and the program, you can see the outline and the agenda of where we hope to go this evening and you'll have an opportunity to for questions um, at the end of Natasha's um, presentation. And also, we'll, you will also have an opportunity to get information about how you can join and support the important work that we are doing. So again, welcome um, to, this, to this space and this time. Next slide, please. Who's doing the land I think can you do the land acknowledgement? Please. Go ahead. And acknowledge that this land and locality belongs to the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabwe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. This land in which we live, move, and have our being, and is the sovereign and original territory of these indigenous peoples within Turtle Island and what many understand as North America. We acknowledge all indigenous nations and African diasporic communities unjustly harmed by generations of imperial domination, subjugation, colonialism, displacement, and cultural genocide, wounding tribes, families, elders, children, and natural resources from the continent of Africa and around the globe. We acknowledge the brilliance and courageous leadership and presence of Black communities who have lived on this territory for hundreds of years. We offer gratitude for all who labor both past, present and future to make Canada a safer and more just environment for racialized peoples. We acknowledge centuries of black and indigenous solidarity, love and resilience. We commit ourselves to confronting and uprooting the principalities and powers of racism and colonialism at all levels of our personal, social and collective spaces. We acknowledge all who came before us, all Black and Indigenous ancestors of the territories we inhabit, and we extend our gratitude and respect to them and to our Creator. And this is, was written by Alicia Johnson. Over to you, Reverend Savage. No, the, the, the declaration, we haven't done the declaration. We as people of African descent are commissioned and called to be ambassadors of reconciliation. We are called to create opportunities and space for courage building, healing, fellowship and empowerment. This special calling is both a reminder and a challenge to ourselves and to the whole church, that we are no longer destined to just obey, suffer and witness, but to disrupt, heal and lead. Just a little bit about who we are. Um, we are Black, Anglic Black Anglicans of Canada, and we envision the Anglican Church of Canada as a faith community that values and respects the rich diversity of Black people who are empowered to enjoy equitable participation, representation, and a sense of belongingness in the mission of Jesus 
and in the full life of the Anglican Church of Canada. And our mission is to increase the participation, representation, empowerment, and belongingness of Black people in lay and ordained leadership roles in the full life of the Anglican Church of Canada and to develop partnership with our Black communities and other um, racialized groups and oppressed peoples. Welcome everyone. Uh, we are, uh, I welcome you to this evening session where we are having the Ontario Black History Society presenting a topic on the history of the Black Church in Canada. We have Ms. Natasha Henry as the president of the Ontario Black History Society who, who will do so. Let me just give you a little about Natasha. Natasha Henry is an educator, historian, and curriculum consultant. She is the president of the Ontario Black History Society. Natasha Henry is currently completing a PhD in history at York University, researching the enslavement of African people in early Ontario. Through her various professional, academic, and community roles, Natasha's work is grounded in her commitment to research, collect, preserve, and disseminate the histories of Black Canadians. And I'll now invite Natasha to come on. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introductions and thank you um, to the Black Anglicans of Canada for inviting me. Uh, to be uh, to present today, uh, just a little bit, um, if you can imagine, on the Black Church in Canada. So, for the course of my uh, conversation, I talk about the church as yes, as a as a physical building, but also more importantly, church as community and understanding um, the role that the church has played in Black communities, um, you know, since their early presence here in Canada, as well as the interactions and the impact of the church on uh, early Black communities here in what we now call Canada as well. And so I do take a little bit of a geographical uh, survey, um, you know, across the country briefly, just to try to capture uh, and to show an appreciation of the depth of uh, the history of Black churches. So I begin by talking about uh, early churches, Black churches uh, in, uh, in Nova Scotia, which is one of the earliest places of uh, the establishment of, of Black congregations in what we now call Canada. Uh, just to, to begin, in one of the earlier um, records, there was a Black loyalist by the name of David George, and Black loyalists were um, men who were um, they were they fought in with the British military for their freedom uh, during the American Revolution and the British loss resulted in thousands of uh, loyalists, including black loyalists, um, relocating into British North America, what we now call Canada. And over about over, over 3500 of the black loyalists um, went to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And there was a small handful of uh, Black loyalists who settled here in Ontario as well. So David George, uh, as part of that wave of Black loyalists who entered into New Brunswick was a Baptist uh, preacher. And in you know, the early settlement of, uh, of uh, Nova Scotia in 1784, he began traveling and, and spreading the word and did get you know some of a following in some of the different uh, new and upcoming um, emerging uh, towns and primarily black settlements that he would speak to. But he would also begin to speak with um, some of the white settlers of, as well and to share the word. And uh, in the summer of uh, 1784, he wanted to begin uh, some baptizing some of the, the people who were following him. 
and 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 so he did do uh, begin to um, to do some of these baptisms, and actually was then planning to also um, baptize some of the the white people, a white couple particularly who was uh, following him, and news of that got out, and uh, you know as we see with the the race relations at that particular time with the white loyalists and black loyalists coming in, uh, the, the realities of enslavement still being practiced in Nova Scotia, that was not something that was um, looked upon very well. And so David George, some people did try to discourage him for, from um, baptizing this white couple, but he felt led to do so. And so at the time that he was going to do this baptism, uh, a large group of uh, white men were in pursuit of him and actually chased, uh, chased him. This is in Shelburne, um, one of the first black uh, settlements in Nova Scotia. And so in looking for him, this, this mob, they, they destroyed homes, they threatened people. And essentially it, it triggered, um, it, it triggered a, a racial attack on the early on these black loyalists and uh, led David George to flee to another town um, a, a distance away to, for his safety. And this resulted in what was called, it's often called the Shelburne race riot. And I'd like to more accurately phrase it as uh, the Shelburne racial attack. And this culminated because of this event, um, you know, around the David George about to do this baptism, coupled with the climate, uh, the tensions around um, black laborers and black laborers being chosen and paid less over uh, white workers, which again, really, um, created a tense situation uh, for these for these early black settlers. Uh, so this was one of the the early documentations we see of uh, black Baptists in um, in, in early Canada. And, you know, from there we start to see uh, a, a history, an establishment of black Baptist churches um, in Nova Scotia and spreading across. I can stay in, in Nova Scotia and mention um, Richard Preston. He took the name Preston. He was enslaved in uh, Virginia and he, um, he, he was free and went to Northern States and then eventually made his way into Nova Scotia. And he uh, began practicing the ministry and, and had a small church in, uh, in, in Halifax. Um, he, he wanted to establish a church and become an, an actual, uh, I guess, a certified minister and went to England uh, in 1831 in order to do so. And by this time he had a congregation and he was an itinerant uh, preacher traveling to different places um, lo locally. Um, and so in that sense, there were churches where maybe there weren't necessarily an, like an official church building per se, but churches as congregations were being formed. And so when, um, you know, on his trip to England, uh, the, the congregation in Halifax uh, began the efforts of actually establishing a church and, um, and purchase land and uh, and got some support in order to help to build a church. And so when uh, Reverend Preston came back, um, you know things were you know underway to establish um, this church. It would become the um, an Af the African Chapel. And Richard Richard Preston, uh, similar to this history of the time of um, black ministers in the black church were very active in, um, in anti-slavery efforts. Anti-slavery efforts first in, in, in British colonies because this is the 1830s and then afterwards anti-slavery efforts to end uh, enslavement in the United States. 
And so he was also instrumental in forming what is called the African Abolition Society around the same time that the church in Halifax was being built. And as a quick note, something I'll talk about a little bit, um, the African Abolition Society and the church, they were instrumental in organizing Emancipation Day celebrations in Halifax. And so the church was, um, was built and uh, continued to grow. And in the 1850s, uh, Reverend Preston had a number of churches. There were about 12 Baptist churches um, in, in Nova Scotia. And they decided to come together to, to unify, to create a, a conference, if you will, um, of these Baptist churches. And this led to the development of the African Baptist Association or what is now called the African United Baptist Association of Nova Scotia, which through to today remains um, in existing is a, is a thriving uh, association. The church um, changed its name in 1892 to Cornwallis Baptist Church because the church is on Cornwallis Street and then um, in 2017, a few years ago, when there was uh, more public reckoning around the naming of, um, of buildings and monuments uh, to people who participating in indigenous, indigenous genocide or enslavement, um, the church undertook the efforts to rename the church. And they took the name uh, New Horizons Baptist Church. And then in 2021, just uh, last month, Reverend uh, Donna Rhonda Britton, uh, she's been the, the pastor of, um, of the Church of New Horizon Church. And she was uh, chosen to be the head of the African United Baptist Church. And she is the first Black woman to serve as the organization's president since its establishment in 1854. The Baptist Church also, as I said, is one of the earlier um, Black churches in Canada uh, established it uh, uh, across the, the country. Uh, and, and well, I was gonna say, including here in Toronto. So if you're in the Toronto area, um, it, it First Baptist Church was um, one of the first churches, congregations and churches uh, established uh, in Toronto. The First Baptist Church was formed in 1826 by Reverend um, Elder Washington Christian. He was a, himself a freedom seeker from the United States. And, um, you know, similar to the uh, ministers of the day, he was an itinerant pastor. So he would travel um, and, and, and spread the word and have different congregations in different locations. And so the Toronto church, the congregation was there and then they uh, had, they built an actual building. Um, they, they rented a space and then they, um, uh, they purchased the building. And we see one of their first buildings here uh, in 1840s. And then um, they would go on after some time to relocate uh, again to 101 Huron Street, which is the building that we see here on the right. And so again, you know, looking back at the, the beginnings of the establishment of this church in 1826 is one of the, the oldest churches, um, church congregations to um, remain in operation today. Then there's the uh, Sandwich Baptist Church, which is uh, Sandwich is a town in Essex County, which is now, um, as we could describe as a suburb of Windsor. And this church, uh, similar to the others were formed, um, you know, as a congregation, uh, Sandwich was close proximity to, is along the Detroit River, so close to the United States. And that was a key entry point for freedom seekers uh, coming into Canada on that side. And so freedom seekers came together and they formed this church congregation and then would go on to establish um, a church. The church was built in 1847 
and um, and then they you know they rebuilt um, a, a brick structure after that. Uh, interesting to note here on the the right side this um, this advertisement here on the first of August, and again I'll speak more about Emancipation Day. Was we see here in 1850 1851 that one of the efforts of the congregation was to raise money um, through Emancipation Day celebration, selling meals so that it would help to build the church. And again, this is a church that remains uh, in, in, in operation through to today, has a long history, and is noted again as having played a, a, a crucial role in um, the Underground Railroad Network. Then I wanted to give a, a snapshot of the history of the African Methodist Episcopal churches in Canada, which is another uh, denomination of black churches that were formed here in Canada. Uh, black Methodists in the United States and some of the Northern United States as uh, enslavement waned out, uh, they were, um, permitted to attend some of the churches. However, uh, in many respects, they were segregated within the church, within church services, either being asked to sit, um, you know, in a different section or in a particular set of chairs. And, and you know, thinking about uh, the names of the sections that these um, played, these sections would have been called. So in Philadelphia, uh, in the church that um, Richard Allen, who pictured here, Reverend Richard Allen, uh, would, would attend St. George Church in Philadelphia, um, they would attend and, and as the, num the numbers of Blacks increased, some of the white members um, did not necessarily want to worship with Black members or wanted to ensure that those racial restrictions in terms of where Black should sit um, should be enforced because some of the mem Black members of the church were sitting uh, amidst the um, some of the white congregants. And in an incident, um, a gentleman by the name of Black man, by the name of Absalom Jones, was forcefully removed. And, um, you know, this was something that really was an affront to the Black congregants who decided to leave the church and not to attend in order to take a stand. And so Reverend uh, Richard Allen, he formed um, AME churches, Black churches, and African uh, related to, you know, the fact that they were Black Methodist churches formed churches in 1794 and there were a few a few of these churches in the area and in 1816 he formed the independent denomination of African Methodist Episcopal churches AMECs and he was the first bishop of the AMEC and in a, by this time in 1816, a mere few years later, uh, the church records, the AM, AMEC church records show that there were requests from congregations here in Canada um, requesting permanent pastors. One of the earliest requests was in 1827. Uh, and the church records, as I said, do, do share this. And so when we look at some of these records, we can see again, very early, the um, you know, the establishment of the AME church. And something that's also interesting uh, to look at is the connection that this cross country connection between um, Blacks in the United States and Blacks in Canada in the formation of these churches. So one of the, um, you know, we have by the 1830s, the, the, you know, the establishment of actual of church buildings um, where these congregations grew across uh, Ontario and in particularly places where they had, um, you know, black communities, black settlements. So some of the early AME churches established in the 1830s include the Oral African Church and that's in the Oral Medante area, just north of Barrie. And just recently um, uh, renovated and retrofitted. Uh, another one of the early AME churches is Nazare AME Church, which is now part of the Amherstburg Freedom Museum. And then the Campbell AME Church in Chatham, uh, here is another example. There's also the, the 
Toronto church that was established in 1830s, um, evolved into what is now Grant AME Church. And as I said, you know, across Ontario in places such as Otterville, Hamilton, Niagara, and Oakville. And so these churches continue to expand and they continue to, to grow. And they're quite reflective of where black people were settling, um, looking at, uh, you know, looking at the context of the time and thinking about the, the, the conversations around um, enslavement, um, you know, living lives and freedoms and establishing their communities uh, in, across Canada. And so the churches were really anchors and central to Black settlement and Black life during this, um, during this time period. Another one of the early AME churches is the Salem Chapel in St. Catharines. And the, um, it was established quite early, it, it noted as in um, the very early 1830s. And by 1835, the church had relocated on North Street and that's the same street where the Salem Chapel is today. Um, the, the, as the church grew, um, the congregation um, built a new, a new building, another new building, a brick building in 1855. And then a few short months later, there was um, ongoing, well, there have been conversations around the relationship between the churches in Canada and the United States. And we know in terms of fellowship and meeting and getting together that the realities of enslavement made it quite challenging for um, Black church members in Canada to travel to the United States because enslavement was still thriving. And so there were, you know, conversations around how to handle that and how to, um, I guess, best structure the, the church within the Canadian context. And so in September um, 1856, uh, the AME churches, what they wanted to do is they wanted to create a distinct conference, Canadian conference, separate from the uh, American conference, again, you know, because of what was happening, particularly because of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. And so they um, organized what became the British Methodist Episcopal Church. And um, so these church members um, created this particular, this Canadian conference. They also wanted to, there's conversations about them wanting to identify more closely with Canada um, or the British colony uh, of Canada that granted them their freedom. So this church, Salem Chapel, became part of the, and the others became part of the, um, the BME conference. And this is the church that Harriet Tubman attended. She just lived down the street on North Street and attended this church um, when she was here in St. Catherine, when she resided here for 10 years, for, for about 10 years. The first, um, and so here I'll just highlight another one of these churches uh, in the Niagara Falls area, which was then called um, Drummondville was a smaller town in Niagara Falls on the Canadian side. And so this was one of, again, one of the early BME churches formed in 1836. And then um, the church became a BME church and um, there were efforts to preserve the church building. It was relocated to where it is today. And it was renamed the R. Nathaniel Dett BME Church in honor of Robert Nathaniel Dett. And uh, the preservation of this his historical building um, what was accomplished because of the efforts of the community as led by uh, Wilma Morrison seen here in the picture. It's, uh, it, I wanted to also point out that um, the Chad, the Campbell AME Church in Chatham, when the BME conference was founded, was established, the Chatham Church was named as, it was known as the Mother Church. And early records show that there was by this time 39 churches 
in the conference with chapels um, across, uh, as I said, across Ontario, but also expanding into uh, Nova Scotia and in, um, and in other places as well. Here, just uh, showing a few others of the uh, BME churches, uh, the Guelph BME Church, which was um, first built in 1888. And, uh, and, and something I'll talk about at the end is, is again is in terms of the preservation of some of these actual buildings, uh, but the Guelph BME Church um, was going to be sold and a group came together formed the Guelph Black Heritage Society and purchased the church building and is now the building is is used as um, the Guelph Black um, Heritage Hall. Again, you know, looking at sharing the history of um, Black settlement in Guelph. And then the Toronto um, BME Church and the build, building, uh, iterations of building, but this building here, pictured here, in the 1950s was the brick building that was built. And, uh, and again, so this was uh, an important part of the black community in what was called the St. John's Ward in that vicinity there and in the city hall, Toronto city hall area. And um, was recent, was excavated, actually the site was excavated uh, a, a number of, of years ago. The history that the both we see both um, conferences, the AME and the BME, in um, embodied here in these two pictures in, in, with, in London, Ontario. So on the left is an older image of what's called the Fugitive Slave Chapel, and that was the AME Church in London, Ontario, established again in the 1830s. And then uh, in the second image we see here. The, the BME church. So the, the AME church um, in this original location, then on this picture, um, when the church was expanding, they moved to another location and built uh, another building, a brick building. And then at that time is when again, like the other churches it entered the British Methodist Episcopal Conference and it became called the uh, Beth Emanuel Church seen here. And then a few years ago, um, the Fugitive Slave Chapel remained as there as a, as a relic of, of the past. And uh, someone who owned the land was going to tear down the church uh, for a parking lot. And again, you know, through a lot of F community efforts, um, the, 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 the church was actually relocated uh, to be preserved to uh, right beside the, it's, but it's, it's um, predecessor, uh, the BME church here. And so we see both uh, the Fugitive Slave Chapel side by side with um, the BME church here in London. And so there are efforts to, again, to preserve this original uh, structure. For the BME conference, uh, Again, when we look at you know how the church grew uh, and shifting into a and a particular Canadian conference, uh, there were a number of early leaders and organizers in this effort. The first bishop of the BME conference was Willis Nazary, of which you'll note that the church in Amherstburg was named after him in his honor. Uh, the second bishop was Richard Randolph. Disney, and then a following um, bishop uh, was uh, Walter Hawkins, seen here. And so we see, um, you know, in, in keeping with the time, that the, the leadership of the church was, was male leadership. And a lot of the men were the public facing leadership of, um, of the church. But it's also important to know that I'll touch a little bit on, you know, the integral role that Black women played in the formation and the, the sustaining of these churches. And so, as I mentioned, the BME church would go on to expand into Winnipeg, Manitoba, Montreal, Quebec, uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And the conference, the Canadian conference then extended out into Bermuda as well to include Bermuda. 
so as these, as I said, so these men as the leaders would go, um, you know, do a lot of the itinerant traveling, um, lead the church, help to grow the church, uh, you know, and uh, and were some of the people like again who were leading in some of these. Or at least we see in the documentation the conversations around not only the church but also what were some of the issues and the conversations in the black community at that time. But as I highlight, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, when we talk about, you know, raising money to actually build church buildings, to erect buildings, um, Black women played an important role in the fundraising and helping to establish these churches. When we talk about um, all of the, the work, the community work that these churches did, again, the women of the churches um, were leading a lot of that work. And so the leadership of the women um, would, would look differently for, you know, than the men, but it was equal and important leadership. Addie Alestock, who's here pictured here on the left, uh, she was, um, she became a, a BME church minister, and she was the first woman minister to be ordained in that church, and the first black woman to be ordained in Canada. She's the descendant of freedom seekers who settled in Glen Allen uh, in Wellington County. Uh, she would go on to work in the communities of Africville in Halifax, uh, the, the church, the BME church in Montreal, in Toronto, and in Owen Sound. And again, she played an important role in um, helping to organize these congregations and, and to uh, sustain these congregations. And here is a picture of uh, the, the women's uh, auxiliary of the BME Church in Windsor, who were just here it, it, with a picture of a quilt, one of the many items they, that they put up for sale uh, to raise funds for the church building, but also for the community efforts that they were undertaking in the church as well. Black churches continued to be established into the, the, in the 20th century uh, in, in Canada as the population uh, grew in different places and expanded out west. Now here is the Union United Church in Montreal, um, in Montreal, Quebec. The congregation formed uh, very early in around 1905 and they, they rented space in a couple of uh, buildings, a couple of mechanic halls, and then they purchased the building that they're in in 1916. And again, this church uh, remains uh, a, a congregation in operation today. The, and I should say here as well, even though I will talk a little bit more about the roles of the church, that they were instrumental in helping to, to, to establish the Negro Community Center and um, you know, offered a range of uh, community services and support uh, in their work. Here's a picture of the Shiloh Baptist Church in Saskatchewan. And this church was built uh, around 1912. And they, these are African American who came from Oklahoma at this time period, when the Canadian government uh, was offering land to settle the Western provinces. Uh, there were just so there were upwards of, I guess, about 800 um, African Americans who responded and, uh, and came in and, and settled in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And so, as I said, a concentration of them also settled in Saskatchewan. And so here is um, the Shiloh Baptist Church. Uh, today, it's a historic site, um, not a congregation in that's, in, in, in that's in operation, but it's noted as a historic site. And then in Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, you know, by it, the, the early 20th century, the early 1900s, uh, there were 
Black people from the United States continuing to come into Canada, but there were also Black Canadians traveling from different places, some coming from the East to the West, again, when, you know, the Western provinces were offering land and, you know, going into British Columbia, uh, you know, in response to earlier on in response to the gold rush, um, but then also just, you know, the movement of, of, of the internal movement of Black people in Canada is, is quite interesting to see. And we see that in the formation of the churches. This church was formed uh, in, in the uh, 1940s. This is the Fountain AME Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, we see here the, the choir and uh, the church building. And um, there was a neighborhood called Hogan's Alley, which had a, a large concentration of, um, of black residents. And they, you know- Sorry, Natasha, let me, sorry to, to stop you, but there is a lot of background noise coming at your end. Um, I'm not quite sure which this, whether it's a shuffling of the paper or your microphone, but there's a lot of, um, noise at the back. Thanks for that. Let me shift the microphone, maybe. Okay, sorry, sorry to disturb. Does it stop? Yeah, that sounds okay so far. It might be the microphone. Thanks for that. Yeah, it is definitely the microphone. It just starts shuffled again. Okay, okay please continue. Yes, and so this, um, and one of the uh, principal people who helped to organize the church and make it happen uh, was Nona Hendrix, who was the, the grandmother of musician Jimi Hendrix. I want to touch now and looking at, so I talked about establishment of black churches and we see um, how this is formed from the 1780s, um, you know, church buildings, but also, you know, church communities. I wanna to touch a little bit on the relationship with black Canadians to the, um, to white established churches, the Church of England and the Catholic Church. Um, because that has evolved over time. And as we can see, you know, us being here with uh, the Black Anglicans of, of, in this um, group. As it relates to uh, the Church of England and uh, the Cath and Catholic Church, you know, the earliest interactions of people with people of African descent is connected to the history of enslavement. And um, that it holds true very much here in Canada. And so from, you know, French colonization, the Catholic church, and then um, British colonization and the, and the Anglican church, um, we see here again, how we, the relationship between uh, black people is through the, the churches and uh, many church members, church leaders, um, themselves enslaved indigenous and black people in Quebec, uh, here in Ontario. And, and so some of these earlier relationships, this is what we see playing out. Uh, and, and we here is an example of um, early records of St. Mark's Anglican Church, which is in uh, Niagara on the Lake. And we see here, um, you know, just a, a few of uh, some of the, the Black people who were enslaved in Niagara on the Lake in 1797. Uh, and so some of these records, again, we see this um, coming through. Over time, um, you know, with the abolition of uh, slavery here in Canada and in Ontario, uh, Black uh, people, Black Canadians, um, were members of uh, Anglican church congregations and, uh, and Catholic congregations as well. And we see an evolution over time uh, in terms of their relationship and increased leadership in these churches. I wanted to touch here a little bit on uh, St. James Anglican Church because I found uh, in my research for that history, um, the church and the relationship with the black community to be quite interesting. Uh, St. James Church or the Cathedral of St. James is a uh, downtown Toronto. And um, so similar to the, to the, uh, the church is one of some of the earliest records of black people in relationship to the church where those were or, or enslaved. But then as we start to see more, uh, uh, an increase in the free black population in, uh, in Toronto, 
we see um, black people as members of St. Of St. James Church. We see, um, you know, documentation of uh, families being baptized, um, couples being married uh, through St. James. And so that, uh, you know, those relationships we start to see uh, over time. And one interesting thing about St. James uh, Church under the leadership of Reverend Henry Grasset here in the center was that uh, St. James Church uh, played a role in the commemoration of Emancipation Day in Toronto um, from the late 18, um, 30s uh, into early 19, 1850s, the church played a role in terms of having Emancipation Day services. Uh, Reverend Graf, Grasset would speak either at the church here, the church location, or at, for example, at St. Lawrence Hall at different locations where they had speaking engagements and church service. And so, and it also hosts some of the social events that took place after the church services and after the, parade, the, the parades um, through the streets as well. And so I document that um, in my book on Emancipation Day. And one, what is interesting about um, in looking at Emancipation Day, we do see um, you know, and have a deeper understanding of the role of the church across Canada in black communities and to black communities uh, and the role that they played in commemorating Emancipation Day. And again, as I said, starting off with, you know, sunrise services, helping to organize all of the festivities and speakers and all of these things involved, um, you know, in Emancipation Day celebrations. And so that's something that I outline uh, here in my book on Emancipation Day. These churches, the black churches that were formed uh, and looking at and understanding their context, some of these churches were formed uh, as a, in response to racial exclusion um, by white churches and by white church leaders. But there was also um, the preference for black affinity spaces of worship. Um, and they wanted to foster that community uh, amongst the black, black, amongst black community members. What is also, again, something that I pointed out earlier, what is also interesting to see and what it also shares is that transnational interaction between Black people in Canada, in the United States, and even in the Caribbean as it relates to um, church activities and the, the growth of the church as well. The church played um, an important part in uh, the communities uh, they were absolutely places of, of worship and spiritual growth. They were also very um, active in the anti-slavery movements, both in British colonies and in the United States. They were the hubs, they were the anchors of communities that were being established by freedom seekers. They assisted freedom seekers with food, shelter, uh, clothing, they provided education to freedom seekers, adults and children alike. Uh, these educational components also included having speakers, also included helping um, in, in training with particular skills for men and for women as well to help to support them in their life in slavery. So they were hubs of worship, but they were also important centers of social activity and political activism as well. Um, and, and, and when we look at the history of challenging racial discrimination and anti-Black racism, uh, there is, you know, there is a record of church members and church leaders being very active in doing so. In one quick example, as it relates to Emancipation Day, that which I was speaking about, Emancipation Day celebrations were coordinated by the Chatham AME Church. Uh, in partnership with another church and they went to a park in Leamington. And um, essentially what happened in, in going to the park, uh, someone called the police on them and they were asked to evacuate the park because it was getting to evening and they should not be in, in the park um, by after sundown. Uh, that was what they were told by the police. And so they did leave, but um, immediately upon returning to Chatham, they spoke to the media, the then newspapers, 
they demanded an apology. They went public with their treatment and spoke about, you know, having to endure this treatment and celebrating free, at the time when they're actually celebrating freedom to have their own freedoms restricted in this way. And so that was just, this is just one of many examples of the role that the Black church played in helping to further the cause for racial justice. And we also see, see through the churches and the activities of the churches and their roles of the community, the role that they played in, um, in self-determination of, of Black Canadians. And so that's also something that I wanted to point out. And, um, you know, and having time to, to make sure we have time to take some of your questions, uh, for me, as someone who, um, you know, studies and continues to learn about um, just the, the complexities of Black Canadian history, uh, church records contribute to the documentation of Black history in Canada, whether it be, um, through you know earlier records in terms of enslavement, but also the records of Black churches themselves, those conference records of AME and BME churches, uh, really helps again to illuminate uh, you know certain aspects of Black life in Canada, and so they are you know important sources of of historical information as well. And so I hope you found my brief talk to be informative, uh, and you know to insightful in the sense that we can take so much from learning about um, and looking at and studying the history of the Black church and its evolution uh, and thinking about, you know, whether it's preserving some of this history, preserving some of these historical sites that remain with us today. Um, and we, and um, you know, but also thinking about um, current Black history in the church today. Again, here we are with the Black Anglicans of Canada and how that history is ongoing. So thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, 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 <laughs> great minds think alike. It, it, it's good for, for us to have the opportunity to hear some questions. One, One of the questions that arises, could you elaborate a little more on the role of the black churches at why, why they were so critical within the communities? Could you say a little more on that for me, please? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, and that could be a whole, you know, that could be a whole, <laughs> set, a whole set of books. A summary. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I, you know, we look at the history of black people in the Americas and, um, we look at their relationship with the church and how they created their, you know, their ways of, of, um, of spirituality uh, and, and, and Christianity. And so that was an, an anchor in, in, the, in the community. I don't know if anyone has had the opportunity to watch um, the Black Church series that was shown on PBS last week, but it just gives you again an overview of um, you know of the beginnings from those who were brought in enslaved and their practices and how you know Black churches grew and evolved over time, and so the church as a as a as a community, um, it was important for um, for those who were enslaved as you know for them to come together. Um, yes to worship but it was also still very much that fellowship it was also very much uh you know plotting to you know that political activism against slavery uh, and so that traveled with black people wherever they went and that included you know being brought into canada and so whether it was you know living a life in freedom at that immediate time but then also post emancipation and how black you know black to continue to grow black communities and to make sure that they were cohesive and members of the black community continue to grow and educate and um, be well situated in society the church played an important role in that. Um, there's a question, the Shiloh Baptist Church in Saskatchewan, where is it located? Do you have a... So it's in Saskatchewan and it's north of Maidstone. So if you look at Shiloh Baptist Church, you'll find, you'll see information because it's a national historical site. So you will definitely see information there. And so while the, the, the Black farming community 
that was there is not in that location still they moved into you know more urban centers and this but descendants of those um those settlers are there today still remain in saskatchewan and in different parts of canada um there's another question here um what sorts of jobs and occupations did blacks have in canada in the 1700s mm -hmm. 1800s and early 1900s mm -hmm. um if you could just do a quick survey on that please yes so when we talk about 1700s the majority of black people who were here were enslaved and so enslaved labor encompassed you know everything as early cult colonies that included clearing land cutting trees clearing land farming um, fishing, mining, uh, women were in, in domestic capacities in homes, um, you know, and some of the, 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 you know, other farming or chore, farming chores as well. Uh, there's, you know, just, just a range of activities, day laborers, uh, there's, you know, farmers. So, you know, talking about harvesting crops and all of those kinds of things uh, that they engaged in post slavery, Mm -hmm. The employment for women, Black women, remained that of domestic service going into um, the 1940s up in, through to World War II. Um, for Black men, we know that, again, there are still restrictions on, in, on their labor, day laborers. Um, yes, there were, you know, skilled men, but in terms of, you know, having steady, secure jobs that was a challenge because of their race um, mm -hmm. and then with the railroad, world black men could obtain jobs as sleeping car porters oh, boy, sure. even though it was a grueling job um, it was still considered a better job for black men given the conditions of of racism uh, you know in employment and those restrictions so those are some of the things uh, some of the employment that black people were engaged in well, thank you for that answer Natasha there's question of um, the black church seem to be uh, in decline is uh, they are not as vocal in social issues and uh, nowadays um, do you find that the case I think it depends on and this it depends with the churches all churches it depends on the churches it depends on the you know the leadership um, it depends on the congregation and point in time, but those are things that have ebbed and flowed and, and, and you know, some of the, the realities that churches have, you know, have to deal with. So if you even look at, for example, looking at St. James Cathedral as a white majority congregation, but look at the activities that they engaged in under Reverend Grasset in the 1830s okay, okay. 40s, right, around yeah. Emancipation Day and speaking out against slavery. Um, but then you can look at it, you know, further on in the timeline and those things change. So it depends on, you know, but it depends on that. And then we have just broadly looking at um, the evolving role of the church today, that that's something that continues to be, uh, I guess, I don't want to say a struggle, but this is an ongoing thing for all churches as well. Okay. Uh, another quick question. What was the impact on the African Canadian churches caused by government efforts to destroy communities like Vancouver, Hogan's Alley, and Toronto St. John's Ward? Are you well, the role of the church? Well, as again, so I, I I ended by talking about the political activism of the church. The church was oh, the, oh. the members, right? And so looking at Hogan's Alley and the fountain, um, the Fountain AME Church, uh, looking at, you know, these church members who would write petitions, they would have meetings. Um, okay. And so they, you know, they did play a, a role in, in our helping to articulate and speak out against the injustices that the Black communities were facing. Uh, Somebody is asking if you know about Augustus Halliday, was a parishioner of St. Thomas Church in St. Catherine. Um, do you know that person uh, or do you know of the history? Oh, mm -hmm. because they were saying, if you knew, you, if they would love to hear a little more on that. No, I, that name doesn't ring a bell. Oh, oh, okay. No problem. I'll go to the next question. What was the impact on African Canadian churches caused by government effort? Oh no, somebody repeated that question. Mm -hmm. My apologies. Something about segregated schools. I thought I saw something. You saw a segregated school? You're probably, we don't. Okay, I don't know. I just saw it pop up. Oh, oh, oh uh, 
Yes, that you're 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 below several questions. I have. Okay, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. All right, let me give you a question quickly. A significant white ally from 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries within the church or outside of, of the church here in Upper Canada, Ontario. So what I'm uh, um from the question it's suggesting that it's asking if what was the, the, the support from our white allies? Well, so there was um, there was uh, some support, and there were white Christians who, you know, had the faith that everyone was equal and should be treated equal, and and so we see that, um, for example, Reverend William King, who founded the um, Buxton Settlement, we have. Um, churches that were in black congregations, but also they, they were um, black pastors, I mean, sorry, white pastors for the church, such as the, um, the church in, uh, in Niagara on the lake. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's different relationships um, with, with individual, um, as you say, white allies who were in support as well. Okay, let me go to another two questions quickly, because I see we are we have to be mindful of the time. Curious to know if any of the freedom seekers who came from the United States brought traces of their Muslim background as Professor Gates shows in his documentary. Mm. So there are two interesting notes. And uh, again, you know, depending on who's, who keeps oh. talking, you often get to learn a lot. But there was one gentleman who was noted in Kingston, and he was noted as having his country markings. Uh, he was free by the time he came to live in Kingston, but when he passed away uh, in the obituary, they talked about him having his country markings referring to scarification, and that even though he attended the, I think it was the Anglican church, but he he did his own um, praying ritual mm, rituals. that were that were Muslim. And then there was a gentleman by the name of Bokwakwa who was enslaved in Brazil, got free, was part, was um, joined a missionary, was escaped, um, sorry, helped by missionaries. And through this mission, he um, went to the United States, was educated, and he spent about a couple, a, at least a year in Canada and at least a year, at, it was uh, in Chatham, Ontario. And mm -hmm. his book that he wrote about his life in slavery was actually actually recorded by someone here in Canada before he went back to the United States. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Is, another, is the Black church in Canada still as active in Canadian politics and in the Black community as it was in the past? So that's an assessment. I think I kind of touched on that a little yes. bit. I think it would um, depend on the leader to depend on the church. And so we can say both yes and no, right? It depends. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'll go to another. We have now reached a question you're talking about, the segregation question. Okay. What were the links between the black church mm -hmm. and segregated schools for black children? Mm -hmm. That's it's one part of the question. It's importance, it's relevance to common, uh, common schools. Um, how well, how were, well were the church schools supported or not? Were the white schools preferred? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, okay, so I'll try to condense that all. So yet, it may not be well known that there were racially segregated schools here in Ontario, particularly okay. in places where they had higher concentrations of freedom seekers, um, such as in Essex County, Chatham area. And so, um, you know, these were the white school officials, public school officials who instituted uh, racially segregated schools, even though there was a choice given by the government for black families and Catholic families to operate their own schools in the face of the discrimination that they face. But what wound up happening was um, white communities did not want, some of these communities did not want black children attending schools with their children. And so they created these, they formed these segregated schools. And so wherever in the jurisdiction black people resided, they had to attend that one school. And so in response, some black families did, did, still did use these schools. Some refused to use these schools. And so, um, you know, they used the church either instead of the church, this, this, uh, the education that um, the church has created and the mis as missions, 
or in addition to um, their public education, they also used um, the educational services that churches provided. And this was done through some of the missionary societies. Um, I, I don't, there's a couple, there's two of them that operated. There's the American Mission Society and another one, like the Propagation of the Social Gospel. Uh, yes, they, and so they help to support. Church. Yeah, so they help to support and fund some of these churches. There was a mission, for example, for Black children in um, in London, uh, run by Reverend Dillon uh, Mission School for Black Children, because the the white school, the, the public school there, the white school was not was turning away Black children, and so the church again played an important role it's in educating, important. and they also again as adults who were coming as freedom seekers and who were not who were illiterate. It, they also educated the adults as well. So it was, you know, and it again, it was important in helping to address that gap there. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Natasha. I um, can't go to the other questions. <laughs> we have gone over time. We've uh, gone over. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go turn back over now to, to uh, Jacqueline. Oh. Daily, okay. our co-chair, she has a couple of things she wants to speak about. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And thank you so much, Natasha. We what an incredible yeah. um, survey you, you've you, you know you've crammed a hundred years or two hundred years <laughs> into one hour. So thank you so very much. We're really grateful. Lots of learning. What was what really struck me is that these communities were thriving before Confederation. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, yes. Wow, like, oh my goodness, uh, it really, that really kind of hit home to me. So um, then the slide again, Vernal, let me just go through a few housekeeping oh. stuff um, oh. so that we can, but Natasha, you are one of us. You're now an honorary member of Black Anglicans of Canada. You, you can thank include you. us in your, in your, in your, um, in your adventures uh, 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 with that uh, in academia. So we're really grateful for your voice and just for being present with us. You're so welcome. for, you know, for, for people and friends out there, um, join us again. Um, we are, uh, you know, Black History Month is a time and space for us to kind of um, create those um, spaces for conversations. And so this Friday, um, the 24th, um, we're having a kind of a Bible study. This is just something that we came up with, I think, a couple months ago. It's for Black, Indigenous, and people of color space. And so um, please join us if you if you are a, a member of the BIPOC community and you can, again, register on on. Uh, on what is event right and again um, we're hoping to do this every fourth friday i believe Brittany will be um leading this one uh, so please um I'd love to see as many of you out on friday as we do our virtual bible study try to make the best of a pandemic and then um, um ken and stephen has already given you the full details about the 26th annual black history service it's going virtual and and it's going to be epic so please again this is for everybody our entire family is um is welcome and that's happening this Sunday at um, 4.15. And again, um, um, all are, are welcome to participate in the celebration and you can register on Eventbrite. And I believe the link was also sent out to everybody. Yeah, um, it's all in the chat. Time. And again, if you were saying, oh, I want in, I want in, I want to be part of Black Anglicans, guess what? You have an opportunity. And so if you are a Black person who worship, work, serve, study, volunteer, Right. If you just have a heartbeat um, <laughs> in the Anglican Church community, in the past, in the present, or if you just have a burning desire, I want to be part of these Anglicans. Um, you, you you aspire to be part of the Anglican community and support the the mission and vision of Black 